if you had to describe your life like you're experiencing it, how would you describe it? Would you say it is a mere existence? It is an unending rat race. That's what my life is. A continuous battle, a schoolroom, a time of training, a time of real discouragement. Somehow you are going through some period of suffering in your life and it seems to be endless. Or would you say that your life is one absolutely fascinating, exciting journey? That it is a challenging time in your life? All of us go through different seasons in our life, and so sometimes if the season lasts too long, we just have the idea that that's what life's all about, just one big heavy burden. But that's not really true, because all of us go through those seasons. Sometimes there are more clouds than there is sunshine, and we're often prone to think, well, is this what life is all about? No, that's not what life is all about. Life really is all about something very, very exciting. And that's what I want to talk about in this message today, no matter where you are, and what you're feeling and how down you may be or how up you are. The issue is what is life really and truly all about? And so the title of this message is Living Life to the Fullest. And I want you to turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 12. And there are three, two verses here that I want us to look at primarily. Because I believe in these two verses, God gives us not necessarily some uh, formula, but he gives us a perspective. He gives us an insight, an understanding of what life is all about and why we can live it to the very fullest no matter what's going on. And let me say right up in the beginning, living life to the fullest does not require that I have all the wealth that I want. It doesn't require that I have all the education that I think I may need. It doesn't uh, require that I have all of, the, uh, a, all of the acceptance or all of the uh, recognition that I need. Life lived to the fullest doesn't require that. But he tells us in this passage exactly what is required. So beginning with verse 1 of chapter 12, he says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and protector of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so when we think about living life to the fullest, first of all, according to this passage, it involves the encouragement of others. All of us who are believers, I certainly hope you do at least, have at least one or more people who are your encouragers in life. That is people who will encourage you and say, you are just doing fantastic. Or, you know, I see some real improvement in your life. Or, you know, I notice God's really beginning to use you. And I notice how you teach your class. Or I noticed the last time you sang or, or all these things. And I noticed that you're more free in your witness and all kinds of encouragement. These are the kind of people who uh, are there to pray for us when we stumble and fall on the track. And these are the people who are there to cheer us on when we're doing well. Everybody in the Christian life needs an encourager. And so if you're one of those persons who says, well, you know, I don't know that I have any encouragers. Well, find yourself some. You say, well, how in the world do you find an encourager? Make a friend. When you make a friend who's a true godly friend, you're going to find somebody who will encourage you in your walk, in your Christian race. And so he says, this great cloud of witnesses. Now, when he's referring to these witnesses, let me say this, you may have uh, uh, someone in the Christian life uh, uh, as you're moving along and you're growing who's not necessarily all that excited about your spiritual growth. They may be going through some difficult and hardship in their life and things don't seem to be going so well for them. And so when they see you progressing and moving along, they may sort of gloat over that a little bit, be a little bit jealous. But don't worry about those folks. You've got people who will encourage you, lift you up, pray for you when you falter, and cheer you on when, you're, when you are excited about what's happening in your life. Now, when he talks about this cloud of witnesses, what he's referring to primarily are those Old Testament saints uh, who've gone on before. And he says, we have this great cloud of witnesses, not that they're up there pulling for us, but that they have been a tremendous, awesome example to us. And uh, what he's referring to is the life that they've lived, the difficulty they've gone through, the hardships and the troubles and the trials. Look at them, look how they responded and look what God did in their lives. 
And so what he's referring to is the pattern, the example, the model that these Old Testament saints have been. Well, there's a second thing involved, I think, in living life to the fullest, and I think it's found in this passage. Notice what he says now. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. Now, when he mentions the word here of um, encumbrances, of course, those people knew uh, how encumbered they could be. For example, those men wore robes. Well, imagine uh, getting on the starting line of a race with a robe hanging all around your feet. And so he says, you must lay aside every encumbrance. And so they dress down for the races. Uh, that word uh, is, uh, means uh, uh, something of bulk. Uh, it can be the word that is used to, uh, to relate to a tumor, uh, something that doesn't belong there, something that hinders, anything that would hinder a racer. Now, the runner is going to dress down because he doesn't want anything to deter him with speed and reaching the goal. In the Christian life, we also have those encumbrances, those things that impede, those things that hinder us on our walk. Because as we are moving in the will of God, anything that hinders our keeping the pace with God and His will and His timing, which is so very important, anything that distracts my attention, gets me off course, or gets me off on some detour, is an encumbrance. And so those things, he says, we have to deal with. Now, uh, that can be some habit in your life, or it can be some hobby in your life. Uh, it can be some sport, or it can be watching television. If you have an overemphasis of that in your life, an overemphasis on anything, overemphasis, for example, uh, on money, or whatever it may be. And you see, it's not easy for us to, to indicate in somebody else's life what their encumbrance is, because we may not even know what it is. We don't know what they're thinking. It just may be the way they think about things in life. The way they think about God is so negative and, and so limited that it is a tremendous encumbrance uh, to their moving ahead in their Christian life. It may be doubt. It may be fear. Anything that hinders, impedes, slows us down, gets us off track, gets us out of the will of God, he says these things are encumbrances in our life and they need to be removed. Now, what may be an encumbrance to someone else may not be an encumbrance to you. And what may be an encumbrance to you may not affect anybody else at all. For example, let's say that you have a scuba dive, and so he wants to go down about 50 feet or 100 feet or whatever it may be. More than likely, he may put lead weights on the belt around him, and those lead weights will enable him to sink more swiftly, and uh, he uses those weights for his benefit. But a runner out here on the starting line waiting for the gun to go off, uh, having about 25 or 30 pounds of lead weight around him, there would be a terrible impediment to his racing. So you and I can't look at someone else's life and say, that's an encumbrance in your life. Well, this is an encumbrance in your life. Some things may be very evident, but that's not our job to be looking for other people's encumbrances. Our job is to be looking at our own, examining our own life and saying, what is it in my thinking? What is it in my habit? What is it in my lifestyle that hinders my keeping my focus upon the Lord, walking in Him, doing His will, following Him, allowing Him to work His will and His way in our life? And so all of us have to examine those things. Sometimes they're subtle. They're not always easy to identify. It may be that we have sort of thought that way so long, we think, well, that's the way you think. But that is not the way you think. Or, or we may have habits in our life that have been there for years and years and years, and we think, well, you know, that's just the way I am. Well, just the way I am may be a real encumbrance to my spiritual walk. And as we said before, oftentimes, doubt, uh, just a little doubt that uh, lingers in our life about uh, God's purpose and does, does He really care or does He really have a plan for my life or, or oftentimes making decisions, our whole our whole way of looking at life. We make decisions and ask God to bless us or do we seek the mind of God before we make that decision? And so there are many, many areas in which we can be encumbered and that is we can be hindered in our walk and our race with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says we are to lay these things aside. Now, how do we lay them aside? Well, the first thing I have to do is be honest enough to examine myself to see what is there that is hindering me. And secondly, I must make a decision to deal with it. And I would have to ask the Lord, I'll say to him, Father, I thank you for showing me this, and I want to deal with it. I want to confess that uh, this does not need to be in my life. It may not even be a sin. We're not talking about deliberate, known, willful sins, but those things that crop up into our lives, or sort of, uh, we sort of drift toward, and as we said, thinking or actions or whatever. And 
We have to identify them and to say, Lord, I do believe this is something that uh, is hindering my walk. And so I just want to lay this aside. It may not be as easy to lay aside as we think it would be. So it's something we have to depend upon the Holy Spirit to enable us to turn away from that, let loose of it, walk away from it, whatever it might be. I'm holding on to something that's keeping me from walking in the will of God. He's just laid aside, put it aside, deal with it, turn away from it, and make it right between you and God. Now, you would think that uh, this next phrase, he'd have put them all together. Look at this. He says, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Now, to entangle means to trip them up. To, that is to get tripped up by something. Well, would not encumbrances and sins be the same? Not necessarily. An encumbrance is something that's more subtle. You have to sort of look for that because, as we say, you may have lived with it a long time. It may have been the way you've been thinking all of your life. And so when he says, and the sin which so easily uh, entangles us, what is he referring to? Well, I think he's referring here to, first of all, if you'll notice, he doesn't say S-I-N as sins, but the sin which so easily entangles us. More than likely, and I wouldn't say this is true of everybody, but probably for most of us it's true, that is Satan has one tool that is the most effective of all. It is the one that he usually at least can get a little uh, leeway in our life if we're not careful. He says, dealing with this sin, laying aside this sin which so easily besets us. That is, there may be some particular weakness in your life. It may be doubt. It may be this issue of finances. It may be greed. It may be lust, whatever it might be. But it is an area in life in which we have to keep struggling with and fighting against. It's the one that somehow Satan, no matter what we do, he seems to be able to get a little toehold, a little edge every once in a while. He says we have to deal not only with these uh, encumbrances, these things that are sort of subtle that might, may not be quite so evident, but he says sin, those things that we know to be deliberate, willful choices of disobedience to God. And he says it's the sin, if you'll notice, that so, as he says, easily besets us. It's the one thing we seemingly can falter and fall to the most frequently or the most easily. He says it entangles us, trips us up, ensnares us. Now, uh, when you think about that, you have to ask yourself the question, Lord, is there some area of my life or is there something that Satan can tempt me with that somehow, in spite of my best commitment and my continuous devotion to you, uh, somehow I am more easily entangled or tripped up here than any other way? He says, whatever that is, we need to treat it the same way we treat these encumbrances. We need to be able to identify it and to deal with it. And so often, as you look back in the Old Testament again, for example, the New Testament, you'll find uh, in, in some of these lives of uh, the saints of God that they too had these areas in which Satan could also entangle and entrap them. If we're going to live our life to the fullest, we must deal with those things we have to struggle with because it is those kind of things that will cause us to stumble and to fall and to fall off the track. It is those kind of things that cause us to begin to look out yonder instead of keeping our eye on the goal. And we want to get detoured. And sometimes it's things in a person's life. Uh, their desire to have things because things gives them a sense of worth and value. Things gives them a sense of, uh, of acceptance. If they get enough things, they can make a big enough impression, then they'll be more accepted and uh, feeling more accepted, they'll feel more loved and Feeling more love, they'll feel better about themselves. When all of that is a trap. Listen, Satan has more traps than we could ever begin to imagine. What is his goal? His goal is to get our eyes off the goal. His goal is to get us detoured out of the will of God, doing something that we want to satisfy some desire need in our life. And therefore, we get out of the will of God, then we're not going to live life at the fullest. It doesn't make any difference what appears to satisfy. Only one thing makes it possible for me to live life to the fullest, and that is being in the center of God's will, moving in that direction. Does that mean we'll be perfect? No. Does it mean we won't stumble? No. Does it mean we won't falter? No. Does it mean we won't get tripped up? No. But it means at least I'm on the track, moving in that direction. And when I stumble and fall, I recognize what caused it. I thank God for his forgiveness and get up and keep moving in the same direction. That may require strong self-discipline on our part. 
just like the runner. He has to practice and practice and practice and practice and watch what they eat. And the self-discipline in order to win the race is extremely important. The same thing is true in the Christian life. And even though we say when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and He's living His life in and through you, that doesn't mean that we do not have to bring every area of our life under discipline, under the will and purpose and, and plan of God. And sometimes that's not easy to do. That's why he says, lay these things aside. We have, we have to rely upon him and trust in him. And that's why you have to stay in the word of God. What does God say about this? How did this work in someone else's life in the New Testament? How's it working in other people's lives? How does God give them victory uh, in their life? And so there are things we have to bring under discipline in our life in order to live life to the fullest. Then he says one other thing, and I want to close with this one. You'll notice he says uh, in the next verse, he says, in this Christian life, if we're to live life to the fullest, we're to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what does he say? If we're going to live life to the fullest, we're to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, let me say this and listen carefully. If you will focus your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not going to say that always, instantly, it's all over and everything is wonderful. And you may go through a season that God allows you to be able to sense what it means to be down and discouraged and depressed and, and, and beaten down in order to make us sensitive to people who live that way. But if you get your focus on Him, it won't take long till something happens in your thinking. When you focus your attention upon him, what happens is you begin to think the way he thinks. You begin to see him as he is. You are reminded of this loving, unconditional, loving Savior, this Lord, this Christ, this Jesus, who not only is in heaven, but this Jesus is our running companion. And you see, you and I never run alone. We may feel lonely, but we never run alone. Because the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm abiding in you and you're abiding in me. He's always a step ahead of me to show me the way. Always a step behind me to pick me up when I falter. Always by my side, whispering in my ear, keep going. Keep moving. You're doing good. You'll make it. Always there to pick us up when we skin our knees or skin our face. Skin our elbows. Skin our hearts. Skin our minds. Skin our spirit. He's always there running with us. He is our traveling companion. He's our running companion, and he will never allow you and me to take a single step from the moment you received Jesus Christ as your Savior when you were on the starting line the moment you were saved. I was 12 years of age. Not one single step have I ever taken that he was not living on the inside of me, standing by my side, moving ahead, moving behind, there to protect and to provide and to keep. When we don't listen to his encouraging word, we fall to right in his presence. And what happens? He is always there to lift us up. He's not going to shove you off the trail to say, you blew it again. Because he knew before he ever saved you, you and I would falter. We'd fall off the cliff. He'd have to reach down and pull us out. He'd have to reset our feet, reset our focus, get our minds straightened out, get us moving in the right direction. That's this loving assistant who walks by our side, who runs by our side. He is our companion in the race of the Christian life. He's always there. And the reason he says in this passage, fixing your eyes upon him, that is so that you have undivided attention. He's the perfecter of faith. And he says here, who for the joy set before him, which was doing the Father's will, he endured the cross. No matter what he had to face, he was committed to doing the Father's will, despising the shame. He said he went through victoriously, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And what's he been doing ever since? He's been interceding for you and me and running the race with us. And he is our greatest encourager. If you and I are going to live this life to the fullest, I mean, if we're going to live it to the fullest and enjoy it no matter what we're going through and whatever we're facing in life. You see, it has nothing to do with my external circumstances. If you and I are living in the center of God's will, that is, if we're committed to doing the will of God, we are committed for Him to working and molding in our life, then whatever storm He sends us through will be to His glory ultimately. Whatever difficulty and hardship and adversity and suffering He takes us through, what's He doing? He is building something within our life. What is he doing? He's building endurance. Now listen to this. Why does he build endurance in this storm? I'll tell you why. Because he knows he's going to allow another storm. And endurance here equips me for the endurance later. And that endurance has not only built 
and working in our life to equip us for the next storm, the next trial, and the next heartache, but it is also preparing us for more effective ministry, more effective ministry in other people's lives, more expanded ministry in someone else's life. And it makes no difference who you are. God has gifted you and God has talented you. And He has equipped you and He's in the process of equipping you to be a blessing to other people. And as you and I walk through the storms and we face the hardships and we, and we, and we get up after we have fallen, but we keep moving toward the goal and we do not allow anything nor anyone to divert our attention long from the goal that God has set for us. What's going to happen? We're going to experience a fulfillment and a contentment and a joy that is absolutely indescribable and beyond human understanding of the world. They cannot figure it out. Because you see, our life does not get its fulfillment in things. Our life does not get its fulfillment in anything but in doing and becoming the will of the Father. And so he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. You'll stumble and falter and fall and you'll feel so unworthy and so guilty. Fix your eyes on him. And when you fix your eyes on him, you understand this loving Jesus who is your running companion just picked you up. He's the one who's whispering in your ear. You'll make it. Just keep going. It doesn't make any difference how tough it looks right now. You keep your focus on me. I am your Savior, your Lord, your life. And all that you need in these moments in your life, I will be that to you with no exception. Think about this. Running a race and running in the energy of Almighty God. He says, I will go, the psalmist said, I will go in the strength of the Lord my God. The 68th Psalm says, God commands our strength. He says, you'll mount up with wings like eagles. You'll run and not be weary. You'll walk and not grow faint or lose heart. What is this Christian life all about? The Christian life is all about living and doing the will of my Father. The Christian life is all about being conformed to the likeness of His Son. Everything else about the Christian life is secondary to that. The area you serve, how God works in your life, and how He uses you in someone else's life, all that's secondary. If I'm going to live life to the fullest, I must get on the track that He has set for me and set as my goal, not achievement and accomplishment in the eyes of the world, but to do the will of my Father and to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. You say, well, that's no fun, friend. Anybody who would say that hasn't tasted of Jesus Christ and being in the will of God. Because listen, we who are believers and we who are in the will of God, we know what fun's all about. We, listen, we know what joy is all about. We know what fulfillment and contentment and satisfaction is all about. Because you can do everything else in life and without Jesus, the biggest void in your life will still be there very empty. Now, how does it all begin? Here's how it starts. It starts with your recognition that apart from God, your life has no sense of real genuine purpose or meaning. It means you're not going anywhere. Once you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, here's what He does. He not only forgives you of all of your sin, but He sets you in the right direction. You say, but you know, suppose I'm 40 years old. He takes you right where you are. Suppose I'm 70 years of age. He takes you right where you are. You just don't have as long to run. That's all. You don't have as long to run. You won't have as many battles to face. It may be a little tougher on you than someone who's been a Christian a long time. It doesn't make any difference. Now, the will of, of course, the ideal will of God is that you be saved early in life. But suppose you aren't. Does that mean that God doesn't care? No. It means He'll take you anywhere you are, my friend. And if you will surrender your life to Him and tell Him, God, I've blown it. I've had it my way. I am coming to the cross. I'm trusting Jesus Christ to forgive me for my sins by His death at Calvary. I'm just turning my life over to you. He puts you on the track. The Spirit of God comes into your life to enable you, to guide you, to show you. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes your running companion. It starts with trusting Him as your Savior. But what about all of us who have been Christians a long time? Did God a few moments ago say to you, that's your encumbrance? Did He identify one or more things in your life to point out to you to say, You'll run better without that. You'll run smoother without this. You have a clearer sense of direction without that. You need to lay that aside. Or did he say to you, that sin continually entangles you. That's the reason you keep falling down. You keep tripping up on the same thing. And he wants you to deal with it. 
Is he saying to you, don't get disheartened. Don't, don't despair. Don't get depressed. What you're going through is just building up strength and building endurance in your life because I want to use you. I want to do something in your life and in order for you to become and to do what I want you to do, I must build endurance in your life. You must learn to run, swim against the tide and run against the winds. And what I'm going to do is going to absolutely surprise you, but it'll be a joyful surprise. Is that what he's saying to you? And would you have to say today, Father, my gaze has been over here and up yonder and down here and back yonder and over here and all hasn't really been fixed on Jesus. But today, I set my sights on the Son of God to say, Lord, not my will but your will, not my way but your way, not tomorrow, but the beginning today, right now. And my friend, once you're willing to do that, you will start enjoying the Christian life. And no matter how tough it gets, deep down inside of you, the whisper of the voice of Almighty God, you're doing good. Keep moving. Keep trusting. I'm with you, and I'm going to be here as your running companion until you have taken your last step, which is from this life to the presence of Almighty God. Lonely people are unhappy people. They feel insecure, feel inadequate, they feel restless, oftentimes they feel confused, and they tend to waste time because of feeling lonely, because their mind is divided. And when I think about their responses and um, how they operate based on that, they waste a lot of time. And a person's lonely, it's hard for them to concentrate. Their mind gets divided. And they want to do one thing, end up doing the other. They find themselves wasting time wondering about why they feel the way they feel and who's going to help them out. So a lonely feeling is a bad feeling. And so I want us to look at a particular passage of Scripture that you have read many times probably. And, uh, but it's a good, it's a good example of what Jesus says to us when we go through those times. So I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11 for a moment and begin with verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. But my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is a word of encouragement to all of you who feel lonely. Because sometimes you're asking, God, where are you? If you're there, why don't you speak? Why don't you show yourself? Why don't you do something to make yourself known? And the Lord Jesus says, come unto me, and I will show you the truth. I will make myself known. I will lift your burden. I'll take away your loneliness. I'll be sufficient for any and every need that you have. So when we think about loneliness, we think about an emotion that many people are not only troubled by, but overcome by. Do not know where to turn. And sometimes the things they turn to are not the things that help them at all. And so what I want to do in this message is give you some suggestions of how to overcome it. You don't have to live in loneliness. That's not the will of God for us to live in loneliness. And he is our best friend. And if you'll think for just a moment, when Jesus was on the cross, think about this. When he was on the cross, they nailed him to the cross, nails in his hands, his feet. It's in those moments he was paying the price for your sin and mine. And most of all, facing it, without the Father's presence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If anybody understood loneliness, Jesus did. He does not intend for you and me to live lonely. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have a reason to believe the teaching of the Word of God that you will never be, listen, alone again. I didn't say you wouldn't be lonely. 
But once you trust him as your Savior, you're never alone again. No matter what you go through, what you experience, what you suffer in life, how good the times are, you are never alone. Loneliness, yes. And loneliness is a plague in our society and in the world. We have everything that money can buy. We can go anywhere there is to have fun. And somehow, loneliness is like a disease. Loneliness has plagued us, and people are looking for a solution. So let's define briefly what we mean by loneliness. Listen to this. Loneliness is a separation anxiety brought on by the feelings of being disconnected, out of touch. It is a loss of intimacy or belonging, of feeling abandoned, ostracized, isolated. That is, something has happened in your life with somebody, with your family, whatever it might be. It's a disconnect. And people who have been through divorce, death, and all kinds of separations, they understand how absolutely telling that is on their mind, their emotions, and their body. God does not expect us to live a lonely life, and yet multitudes of people are doing just that. They have everything money can buy, but they're lonely. And many people think, well, if I just had this, and if I had that, or if I had him, or if I had her, I would be fine. No, you wouldn't. There's not anything under God's creation or all of it together that can satisfy an emptiness in your life that only Jesus Christ can satisfy. Now, you may be watching or listening or whatever it might be, and you think, well, now, I don't really think that's true because this, that, and the other. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how to overcome that loneliness, and let's see if what you're doing works. I know it doesn't work, or you wouldn't have felt what you felt. This, this sermon, this message may irritate you. Well, if it does, good, because you may be getting along the pathway where loneliness is no longer the way you walk. So let's think about some very specific ways that you overcome loneliness in your life. And the first one is this. Ask the question, what am I doing that's promoting loneliness in my life? You can be lonely and not know why. Now, if some member of your family passes away or separation, divorce, or whatever, we understand that. But what about that loneliness that you can't put your finger on? What about none of those things are true, but you're still lonely, still empty, still trying to figure out what's going on in your life? And so when you ask the question, what am I doing that promotes it, listen carefully. Something is promoting it. Something is promoting loneliness in your life. And if you are a child of God, you should not feel lonely. And if you still feel lonely, you have to ask yourself the question, what is, what, are, what is it about my thinking? What am I doing? What about my relationships that's leaving me empty? And so something is wrong. Especially if you've ever trusted Jesus as your Savior and you're lonely, something's gone wrong. Because you should not feel loneliness when you have the presence of Almighty God living within you, who has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise of God to every single believer. Then, of course, ask yourself this question. Is this the way I want to spend the rest of my life and die and give an account to the Lord for a life of disobedience and waste? In all these years, I have never met a person who said, I used to be a Christian. I used to go to church. I used to do this. I used to do that. But, but I, I just quit. I've never met a person who told me that who is happy, who would even claim to be happy, but always something missing. Oh, I don't go to church again, but I don't do this again, but, but what? Still unhappy, still miserable, still lonely. Because without Jesus, well, think about this, he created us. He didn't have to. He created us. He gave us life. Why? In order to indwell us, in order to so work in our life that we would praise him and honor him and glorify him and live for him and reflect him. 
and spread that awesome sense of fellowship and love with other people. So I want to ask you this. If you're one of those persons who's very happy, do you spread that around? When you talk to people about your relationship to Jesus, do you give him credit for being the answer to your once loneliness? Because the truth is, without him, you don't have it. You can name anything that you possess. Without him, you're still going to be lonely. And so I say over and over and over again, Jesus is the one that does it. When you surrender your life to Christ, here's what happens. The Bible says you surrender your life to Christ. Jesus comes into your life. Watch this. He comes to indwell you through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, seals you. Seals you forever as a child of God. You can't be saved, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, and then unsealed. You may sin against God, and what happens? You lose your joy and your peace. You get out of the will of God. What happens? Do you lose your salvation? No. But you lose your peace, your joy, and your sense of security, but you don't lose your salvation. God has sealed you as one of his children and has the best life possible for you. But if you walk away from him, if you choose to go another route than his route, you're going to end up lonely. And as a result, you'll walk away wondering what happened. What happened is that you became disconnected spiritually with the very source of life. And that's where most people are living. So you ask God to deliver you from any behavior that would drag you back. For example, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're going along fine, and all of a sudden you find yourself being lonely for some reason, whatever it might be. You got disappointed in something, whatever. Be careful not to allow somebody else to drag you back into the old lifestyle you were living in and find yourself once again empty when it was absolutely unnecessary. Listen, loneliness is not natural for a child of God. It's natural for the world because they're not connected to the resource of life and joy and peace and happiness, all the rest. My peace I give unto you, he says, not as the world gives, give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Not, not as the world gives because he knows that's not adequate. That's not sufficient. Come unto me, he says, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you joy. It's a relationship with Jesus. Listen, you can have a relationship with the most beautiful woman, or the most handsome man, most beautiful person in the world, the most wealthy, name it. Without Jesus, you may, you may try to get it together, but you can't get it together because Jesus is the great connector. He's the one who connects us with himself and gives us a sense of joy and peace and happiness and not loneliness. And sometimes you'll meet some of the happiest people you know who live by themselves. If having somebody was essential to being happy and having peace in your life, that wouldn't be true. But Jesus, when you surrender your life to him, he begins to live in you what? A godly life and a life submissive to the Father and a life that listens to the Father, a life that dwells upon the Word of God. That's the difference it makes. So ask yourself the question, where does all that fit in your life? And then think about this. Cultivate a new friendship with somebody who will be an asset in your life. Sometimes that's exactly what's needed to overcome loneliness. Cultivate a friendship, watch this, not with someone who could drag you back down to where you were, but someone who will lift you, someone who will encourage you, and someone whose relationship with Christ is very important. Someone whose language, whose lifestyle, whose dress, whose demeanor, someone that you know looks like this is what Jesus would look like. A genuine friend who doesn't want something from you, but someone who's willing to be a friend to you. You want to overcome loneliness? A godly friend. Somebody who's willing to give of themselves to you in a godly way that will lift us up, not drag us down. 
but he wants us to be strong enough to reach out to people who are living down and who are lonely and who need a friend. But watch this carefully. Be sure you don't listen to the devil who says, well, here's somebody who needs you. Uh, you, you can help them. Just, just go. Not necessarily, because some people will drag you down. They're looking for somebody who will agree with them. They're looking for somebody who will enjoy the same sin that they've enjoyed. That is not freedom, and that is not healthy. It's not what God says you and I should do. Sometimes you have to walk away. God gives us wisdom to who we can help and who we cannot help. Or if we're in a position spiritually to help them. Or if our relationship to Jesus is strong enough that we can give of ourselves to them to help them. He'll show you who to help. He'll show you who you can be a friend to. And who, on the other hand, with the good intentions will drag you down. You think about your children. Think about teenagers, for example. What do you say to them and your grandchildren? What do you say to them? Watch who you run with. Because most of them will want to drag you down. Well, you need to try this. There's some things in life you do not need to try. You need to ask God to give you wisdom to be able to detect in someone else's ideas about what friendship's really all about. Choose to believe the truth that you're not alone, that Christ is with you every, situ every situation in your life. You're not alone. You may feel it, but you're not alone. He's always there. Realistically, he is there, ready to reveal himself to you. Do not believe that you're all alone. And remember, as we said before, and I said again on purpose, remember you have the Holy Spirit living within you. And when people say, well, I just can't, I just can't be alone. What that's saying is that emotionally you are not mature enough to live alone if you have to. And so what do you do? You got to have somebody. Be on guard. Be alert. Be careful. The fire is out there. The traps are out there. The holes are out there. And if you're not careful, somebody comes along, you need to ask questions. Somebody wants to be your friend, find out who they are, what kind of friend they are to somebody else, and who's their friend. If somebody wants to be my friend, I, I, want, a bit, I want to know who their friend is. Their friend could be most anybody. So friendship is absolutely essential to a full life. But friendship, first of all, with the Lord Jesus Christ. He will show you who you can be a friend with. He will show you the person who needs your friendship to, to, for you to build them up. And then I'm going to list some very practical things besides those. And another one is this. Make it a priority to read the Word of God every day. A priority to read the Word of God every day and pray. Now, when you read in the Word of God what God has said and desires to speak to you. Who, who kept, who, who put this together? The man didn't put this together. This is God's word in order to teach us how to live, how to relate to him, how to be a friend, how to be a help, how to have a discerning spirit to know what's right and what's wrong, what's good and not good. He, he's given us his word and the word is like fuel in our life. Keeps us going spiritually and energy within our life. When he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, Paul said. So God's given us his word. We should feed upon his word every day for the simple reason this. Watch this. You head in the wrong direction to somebody, but you're reading the Bible every day, you can mark it down. You're going to read a passage that you didn't, weren't even looking for, and your name's going to be all over it. And God's going to be warning you, watch out, be careful, walk away. That is not the right relationship. Neglect the Word of God, you have fallen into traps. You read the Word of God and you pray daily for God to give you wisdom and direction. And watch this, a discerning spirit to be able to detect what is the will of God and what is not. And listen, the way a, a person may dress like a million dollars, but their character may be worth about 20 cents. <laughs> and so you have to watch what you're doing. The Word of God. Somebody says, I don't have time to read the Word of God. Then you don't have time to follow God. You don't have time to, time to keep yourself out of trouble. 
reading the Word of God and praying every day, asking God to give you direction. Memorize a simple passage in the Scripture that, that you have to deal. For example, if I had some need and I didn't have any idea what in the world was going on, here's a passage I'd read. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory. That is, whatever I need, He's going to provide. Now somebody says, well, what about dealing with situations that can't be changed? And I would say, accept it. Call on the Lord to help you through it. For example, your husband or your wife dies. You say, well, are you telling me that I'm not to feel in loneliness? No, I didn't say that. Naturally, when somebody who's a part of your flesh almost is gone, you're going to feel it. But you feel it in the presence of Jesus. That if God took that person out of your life, he had a reason to take them. And we can say it was this disease, that, that, whatever it might be, he took them. He knew that you would remain alone, and God is going to be there from the very moment to remind you, I am with you. I will never forsake you no matter what. So naturally, there are periods and times and trials in life that you feel it. But the issue is you decide not to stay there. And everybody is going to go through those times when we lose loved ones. Whatever the reason may be, that loneliness is a loneliness that God will use to drive us to Him. When our attitude is right, attitude is right, loneliness can drive us to Him. And then I would say to you, reach out to serve somebody. There's something about giving yourself away to people. Be careful. Somebody take advantage of that. But you just say, Lord, you, you, you tell us we're to be servants. I'm, I'm willing to help someone. Here, watch this carefully. This is why the primary issue here is that the Holy Spirit is living within you who will direct you to who you can help. And so you have to ask him for direction for that. Seek in fellowship with a godly person who will challenge you to be your best. Because sometimes God wants you to be a friend to someone because he knows they have a contribution they can make to you. They don't want anything from you. They want to do something th that will challenge you, grow you up, mature you, help you, encourage you. Those are the kind of friends we all need. We all need the kind of con connection in this life that builds us up, helps us, enables us. Because doing that makes it possible for us to do that with somebody else. He does not intend for us to live lonely lives. Godly people have a connect with the Holy Spirit who will show you exactly who you can relate to and who you cannot relate to. Somebody says, well, that sounds selfish. No, it sounds very, very important because you have to make choices in life. And choices of who your friend will be is a very, very significant choice. Come unto me, all you that labor under heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Because he knows the weight, the weight of loneliness. It's a heavy, heavy, heavy weight. But God can take that weight off and give you a sense of fulfillment and joy in your heart that only he can give. And when I think about how significant it is that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into us so that you and I will never, watch this, we will never be alone. Never. Never be alone. You may feel lonely, never be alone. Because he sealed you with himself. You will always have that connect. It may get ruffled at times by your relationships, but that connection's always there. Now, you know where you are in life. You know who your friends are. I would ask you this. Are your friends dragging you down or lifting you up? Are they looking out for your best interest or their own? Are they giving you presents because they want something or because they love you? Are they truly faithful to you or just giving you the image that they are? Who in your life is a true, genuine friend? Who's courting your friendship who has ulterior motives? In this day and time, we have to ask questions. 
We have to ask for God's guidance and direction and leadership in our life. Then when he gives you a sense of, "Mm, mm, 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 mm," no, 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 no. You don't ignore that and keep going. When God stops you in a relationship, he's saving you from disaster. And so you listen to him, you obey him, and you have the awesome joy of having godly friends who will build you up, never tear you down. Now think about this. What is true of you? True of your children, your grandchildren. You want your grandchildren and your children to choose the right kind of friends? They're going to look at you. Who built up my dad and my mother? Who built up my... What kind of, what kind of folks do my grandparents have? Life is so entwined. We have to keep our eyes open and our hearts sensitive to the voice of God. Then you'll have awesome friends that one day you'll meet in heaven and rejoice together. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you and praise you that you love us enough to want to be our friend. I pray the Holy Spirit will sink these simple truths into every heart who hears them. That you would send a warning to those who are headed in the wrong direction. That you give strength, energy, and enjoyment to those who are walking in your ways. Thank you for loving us enough that we'll know forever that you always have been, always will be our very best friend. In Jesus' name.